good. Two. Go. Uh, just got to put the questions thing off to the side so it doesn't get in the way. Okay. Hello, welcome to the webinar. Thank you for joining me. My name is Evan Jarvis. I'll be your host tonight. Uh, tonight we're going to be taking a deeper look into hand selection. Uh, I'm pretty excited about this presentation. I've studied up a lot over the last two weeks in preparation for this presentation uh, because much like yourself, I'm a student of the game, always looking to improve. And so when there's a topic I want to know a lot about, I, I go in there, I go in my books, I watch my videos, I do my research, and I uh, put all the information together. So I've learned a lot, put it in here. Um, hopefully you learn a lot from it as well. Um, yeah, we're going to be talking about hand selection, a uh, little bit about the things to consider so you can optimize your ranges in various situations to maximize your expected value. Let's get into the action and let's get stack in. Never gets old. <laughs> so first, why talk about hand selection? Uh, Excelling at No Limit Hold'em, Chapter 1. Uh, I wrote about the six ingredients for a winning poker game and a heavy emphasis of that was what I first popularized back in 2008, um, the triple threat, position, aggression, selection. Um, we covered position in the first webinar a couple months ago and aggression in the second webinar last month. All the replays are available on YouTube. And my approach to poker is about getting every advantage you can and the triple threat accounts for three of the five advantages. Um, we've talked about uh, information advantage goes with position, skill advantage with aggression, and today we're going to be talking about card and range advantage and how it pairs with selection. If you want to learn about the stamina, physical, mental advantage, check out Five Pillars of Peak Performance, program I did with Jonathan, and for the psychological advantage, um, get in touch. That's one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, so today we're going to be going into card range advantage and we're also going to be talking a little bit about the betting advantage because they are closely related and if you enjoy this webinar and you want to be notified about future presentations please follow me on twitter at grips poker i will be doing one soon on how to prepare for the world series of poker just finalizing my uh, dates so once again pokercoaching.com so far it's been very fun uh working with the guys at poker coaching i'm very honored to be alongside these great minds been watching some of the webinars from the other creators and wow they have just been absolutely on fire what a wealth of knowledge that uh, jonathan alex and matt are bringing to the table uh, strongly invite you to check out the webinars if you haven't the webinar replays are available on jonathan little's youtube channel and it's just an absolute gold mine yours free. If you've already watched them, congratulations. You are well on your way to becoming the best player you can be. Goals of today's presentation. Uh, first, we're going to talk about range construction and why thinking about it is important rather than just, you know, flying by the seat of your pants. We're going to talk a little bit about the concept of balancing your range. Then we're going to go into when and a little on why you don't always need to be perfectly balanced. Next, we will talk about uh, continuance frequency. Huge shout out to Ed Miller and James Sweeney for teaching me about this. Really, really cool concept. Uh, makes a lot of sense. And as we go through the slides, you'll see why. Uh, next, we're going to talk about kind of the best hands to continue with and the various properties of different hands. Uh, and finally, which situations lead to favoring different properties. We're going to look at the properties of the various hands and then learn how to rank them a little bit based on the situation that we're in. Um, combining points five and six is how we really choose the best hands. And we learn kind of the art of range construction. So first, let's talk about the benefits of optimal range construction. The first benefit is building your ranges enables you to play more hands. Uh, in the first presentation in the series, we discussed how ranges adjust as position changes. Uh, and when you understand how to build your ranges post-flop, you can do the same and play wider ranges because you'll be in more advantageous positions. Fedor Holtz talked about this in his studies 
that finding out how to get the most value out of each part of your range is a major key to success at the highest levels. Uh, next, the second benefit is that it gets you thinking about the game on a higher level. And if you want to play higher stakes or against harder competition, you're going to need to know how to think in terms of ranges and see the big picture. You know, looking at the game from a holistic perspective and kind of zooming out a little bit. Um, this is something I'm also currently working on personally. So I definitely don't have this perfect. I don't know many players in the world that do. Uh, there are some solvers and bots that have it pretty good. But, you know, the best thing we can do is just practice, learn, iterate, refine, and get a little bit better uh, every day. Speaking of seeing the bigger picture, building your ranges properly ensures that each hand gets its maximum expected value, which is a lot of what we're trying to do at the poker table is maximize our EV. Uh, some hands are best for big pots. Some are for big bluffs. Some are good for cheap showdowns. Some are for bluff catching and so on. By planning ahead and building out your ranges with the bigger picture in mind, you'll play each hand to the best of its ability, given the properties that it has. This makes you really hard to play against because your strategy becomes well balanced and pretty bulletproof or barrel proof. And speaking of balance, building your ranges means that you have a perfect baseline, which is that, you know, that old theory of game theory optimal. This is kind of what it moves towards, um, which you don't need to play in all spots because most opponents are not playing perfect, but it's always helpful to know what perfect would be. Uh, lastly, it's not that hard. At least that's what I hear. Uh, no Limit Hold'em only has 1,326 combination of hands, uh, which is a lot less than, you know, Omaha or Pineapple. And in most situations, you'll only be playing between 10 and 50% of that amount. So it's not a huge, huge sample of things to rank and order and keep track of. If you compare that to like stock trading, where there are thousands of symbols out there to keep track of, you can see that the math of poker is much simpler and more complete. You just kind of know all the variables that you're working with, and it's just a matter of organizing them um, to make the most of every situation. So what exactly is range construction? Uh, range construction is choosing which hands you'll take various strategic actions with at each point in a hand. I first learned about this in the mathematics of poker, which was absolutely awesome. And that's where I learned about complex ranges. So with the betting lead, we have betting ranges and we have checking ranges, but those ranges then split further where we have our bet folding range, which maybe you do with your weakest bluffs, like gut shots. We have our bet calling range, which we would probably want to use our strong draws or strong hands in. And then we have our bet raising range, which includes our really nutted hands that we want to try to get as much money in the pot as quickly as possible. Same thing with checking. Uh, we check fold with our weakest hands. We tend to check call our medium strength hands and check raise both the best hands and probably some bluffs too. So we're incorporating the concept of balance. When we bet or when we raise, we don't always have it because then we'd be easy to play against, but we have some bluffs in there too. So we keep our opponents guessing. Um, it's not hard and fast, those examples that I just gave. But that's the beauty of it is when you plan your range, you construct your range and you say, okay, which hands would do best in my betting range, which would be checking. Mm, maybe I can move a hand from my bet raise range to my check raise range instead to keep things a bit more balanced and protected. And we'll talk about more that more as it goes on. But this is the, the nuts and bolts of it is taking the various ranges that you're going to have and allocating your hands accordingly, both your good hands and your bad hands. Without the betting lead, it's the same story. Uh, we raise for value or as a bluff. We call for showdown or with a draw when say we're getting the right pot odds or the right implied odds or as a float, which is basically um, you know a defensive bluff where we call with not much planning to take the pot away later because we think we're gonna be getting the right odds on our bet later. Um, and finally folding, which would be for our worst hands. And the, the main key takeaway from this slide, at least for me, was that when you put a hand in one range, you can't put it in another range at the same time. So what hands you put in your betting range can't go in your checking range. And that's why really looking at all your hands 
and thinking about which ones are going to go where really helps to ensure that your ranges are what we call protected and uh, balanced. Okay. Um, yeah. So next we're going to talk about why it's beneficial to balance your range. Um, the mathematics of poker that we discussed in the aggression webinar says that when we bet, we offer our opponent odds or when they bet, they offer us odds and your opponent's job is to play when the odds are in their favor and to pass or fold when they are not in their favor. Same with vice versa. Uh, when, when you balance your range, you control how often you're bluffing. Uh, so, you know, they win versus value bet. Uh, you win. Oh. Well, typo happens sometimes. And when you do it perfectly, your opponent can't do anything to beat you. So shaping your range, the concept here is that based on the odds that you lay your opponent, if you shape your range accordingly with the right amount of value bets to bluffs, um, you make it harder for them to guess. And if you do it perfectly, there's no guessing. They just, whatever they do, you know, you're, you're giving them two to one. They need to win a third of the time. Well, when they call, they'll win exactly a third of the time because two times you have it, one time you don't. Um, this makes them, this concept's called like indifferent with their bluff catchers. So whether they, whatever they do, they can't beat you. If they call more than they should, your value bets get paid off more. And if they call less than they should, your bluffs benefit. So by having a balanced range, you benefit from both sides of the spectrum. Uh, if you don't do this, you're easy to play against. And I'm sure you've played against that type of player before you know, they always have it. So you just never pay them off or they never have it, so you always call them really light. And by balancing your range, you make it much harder to play against you. Um, yeah. And so I promised we'd talk a little bit about the golden ratio, and this is what the golden ratio is. So again, it's based on the mathematics of we make a bet size, we lay odds to our opponent, and therefore there's a certain frequency uh, at which they're supposed to call based on the odds they're getting. And they have to win a certain percentage of the time. So we balance our value to bluff ratio to ensure that we're just kind of meeting that exact mark. Um, yeah, so example, let's say we bet full pot, lay our opponent two to one odds. They need to show down a winner at 33% of the time. And therefore, if we have two value hands and one bluff, they're going to win that one time we're bluffing and they're going to lose the two, two thirds of the time that we're value betting. So we just hit that exact mark. Um, if we bet half pot and lay them three to one, they need to win a quarter of the time. So we want to have the goods three quarters of the time. And if we bet, you know, an eighth of the pot, we want to have it 90% of the time. Um, so this is a chart that's Worth knowing, uh, only thing to note on the value to bluff ratio is that um, in the case of like two thirds pots and uh, three quarter pot, one and a half X pot and more, I, I rounded up the numbers to whole numbers because when you're choosing your combinations of hands, you can't exactly, you know, have two and a third combos. So to balance that out, uh, I just rounded up so we have whole numbers and you can just balance your combos accordingly. So this is a really handy chart to have when uh, designing your ranges uh, with the bet sizes that you choose. So this makes your opponent indifferent to calling with bluff catchers and whenever they fold you win the entire pot. Um, so we, we looked in the previous presentations about kind of the break even success rate for various bets and then this the golden ratio is how you can allocate your hands accordingly so that even when you do get called, you're getting the best of it. Hope that one, hope that one makes sense. Main thing, grab the chart, save it. It'll come in handy later. And as you practice building ranges, these things will click. They'll make more and more sense. Now, we talked about how to balance our ranges. Now, when you don't need to balance your range, is when you're playing against non-optimal opponents, which is 99% of players, and probably why Ed Miller's book was called Poker's 1%, not 2 or 5%. 
So how to adjust. First thing to do is categorize your opponents and their tendencies with it being situational. Know that some people play differently on the flop, the turn, the river, when the pot is small, when the pot is big. So the more you pay attention to an opponent, the more you can kind of gauge what the risk inclination, how much they like to take on high risk situations or risk aversion is. And then you can also gauge if they change when they're playing a big pot, if they rise to the occasion or if they kind of cower away. And also you can adjust for when people are stuck or they're doing really well in the game. Uh, it's the more you know, the more you're going to be able to make better decisions and adjust for your opponents. So pay attention, categorize your opponents and their tendencies, and that will really pay off. Because you start with your baseline range and then you can deviate. Um, you now have numbers that you can work with for your, your perfectly balanced ratio. And now you can adjust. Say if they call more than they should, then you add more value bet combos and maintain the same amount of bluffs. <clears throat> or keep the same amount of value hands and decrease the amount of bluffs. If they fold too much, you would add more bluff combos or you would take away some of the value combos. Vice versa, when you're facing their aggression, if they bluff less than they should, you would fold more of your weak hand combos, your bluff catchers. And if they bluff too much, you would call with more of your bluff catchers or potentially even raise in the case where you have a hand that can't beat a bluff, but you know they have more bluffs than they should. And therefore, if you raise, you're, you're probably gonna get more folds than you need to to match your break-even success rate. And so why not go ahead and raise? So this is how you can kind of adjust from that baseline range. Uh, but knowing the golden ratio is very helpful because that's something you can revert to, something you can always fall back on, something you can rely on that is kind of safe and secure. Um, so how to add combos. This is where tools like Flopzilla, um, the range tools at pokercoaching.com are really fantastic for this. Or you can do it the old fashioned way, writing by hand. Uh, I'd love to give an example, but it's very tedious and would probably take about 60 minutes to go through one hand. Um, so it'd be a little inefficient, but yeah, maybe, maybe in uh, some future study sessions, we'll dive deep into that because it's, it's a fun thing to work through. Uh, now the question is how much is too little or too much, right? I've thrown these things out there, you know, too much, too little. And you're like, well, relative to what? Based on what? And that's where minimum defense frequency comes in. Um, this is, here's the minimum defense frequency. It's a concept that is often misunderstood. Um, we spoke in the aggression webinar about the thresholds for profitable bets, where if our opponent folds at a certain frequency based on the bet size we chose, uh, we're going to make profit no matter what our cards are. And the minimum defense frequency is that other side of the equation where if we're defending less than the minimum defense frequency, our opponent can be in those situations where they can profit just from their betting and their cards don't matter. If, however, we're meeting the minimum defense frequency, now they have to actually show up with a well-constructed range to find profit from the situation. So the idea behind this chart is that we're preventing our opponent from creating profit or quote unquote auto profiting by betting any two cards. Now, a couple of things about this chart, a um, few things actually. The first is that this chart is for heads up pots. In the case where you're playing a multi-way pot, the minimum defense frequency is shared by all players in the hand. So if someone bets full pot into two opponents and the minimum defense frequency is 50%, Either opponent defends at least 25% of the time you're meeting that minimum defense frequency. Next is that this chart assumes that both players have equally strong ranges and equal equity when continuing. If you're in a situation where your opponent's range is, you know, stronger than yours because maybe he raised from early position and you defended the big blind, you don't have to defend as much as this minimum defense frequency. Or if you're in a situation where your range is stronger than your opponents because you constructed your range more intelligently than they did, 
you can continue with more hands than the minimum defense frequency and expect to show a profit. And this is where building your ranges uh, in an intelligent way makes all the difference. The more intelligently you build your range, the more equity you will have as the hand progresses. Whereas the less intelligently you build your range, the less equity you'll have. And so building your range effectively is a big edge that you can have. Um, now, that's, that's the kind of info about this chart. And I would say don't get up, don't get caught up too much in the specifics of it because it's very theoretical and it assumes average board. It assumes equal strength ranges. It assumes an average board. Um, certain boards favor in position players, certain boards favor out of position players. So this is just in the whole spectrum. If all things were equal, this is how much we should defend based on the bet size. We can then deviate from here, but it's good to know these numbers just have a baseline. Um, the numbers I found really helpful were when facing a quarter pot bet, we want to be defending a huge percentage of our range. And this may mean that we're defending some very weak hands, but also keep in mind when your opponent bets a quarter of the pot, you don't have to win that pot very often to uh, show profit on your call. And that's why we want to defend more and more hands. And it's about picking the best hands of the ones we defend. Uh, and also when facing an over bet, we don't have to defend that often to keep our opponent from uh, making an automatic profit. Um, so that's those are the biggest takeaways I got from this chart, but I just found it really useful to see this chart with all the numbers in front of me to be like, okay, this is about what I should shoot for on average in terms of what percentage of my range I'm continuing with. And now knowing that it's my job to choose the best hands of the ones that I continue with. Um, so again, it's the inverse of this familiar chart from our aggression webinar, which was the break even success rate of the better uh, without carts. And again, um, pot equity, the, the better you build your range, um, the, the less these numbers even need to be. So just building your range as well is just giving you a huge bonus, a huge rebate on everything else that you do at the poker table. Cool. It's choosing the best hands to play pre-flop. Uh, I've got a little, little graphic showing a couple of different types of ranges. On the left, we have a linear range and on the right, we have a polarized range. I made both these ranges using the poker coaching range creator. Really good tool. Um, first time using it and definitely going to be using it again in the future. So the difference between these two ranges, they're both about the same percentage of hands, about 15% of hands. And on the left, we have a linear range, which means the best hands from top to bottom is how we choose our hands. This is the type of range that we're usually going to use in a defending situation. So for example, if we're calling a river bet and showing down, or if we're rejamming preflop and for the times we get called, we just want to have the hands with the highest equity, or if we're say three betting out of position and having to play the hand out of position for the rest of the hand, we want, you know, a nice linear strong range. Whereas, on the right side where we have the polarized range, which has those best hands, you know, nines plus, ace jack plus, ace jack suited plus, and the suited broadways. But then it has the hands on the bottom of the spectrum that didn't quite make uh, the linear range. So the deuces through fours, the lower suited aces, the lower suited kings. These hands and the, and the suited connectors that they have some nice properties to them, the suited aces can make nut flush draws. They can make nut flushes. Um, they also have the blockers of the ace, which decreases the chance that our opponent has an ace. The suited kings can make um, the king high flush. And also these hands have the ability to make top pair one way. And then our drawing hands have the ability to still make sets and straights. Now, a polarized range is used more for aggressing as opposed to defending. Because with aggressing we can win when our opponents fold to our bet. And what did we learn last webinar? That the weakest hands, those with the least equity, benefit the most from getting their opponents to fold. 
So we throw these hands in here because they benefit the most from getting the opponents to fold and we'd rather use, you know, the ace 10 suited through ace 6 and the suited 9x and the ace 10s to call. So this is where if we're going to have a calling range and a raising range and we want to have some good hands in the calling range, we raise the best hands, call with the next best hands, three bet as a bluff with the next best hands and then fold the worst hands. That's kind of some basics of pre-flop range construction. Um, so when building a range, we want some value hands and some bluffs uh, when we're playing you know, with, with the aggression and especially if there's gonna be multiple streets of betting. And this is an example of a pre-flop range with both. Um, now, if we were playing against an opponent who never folded, there'd be no need to include the bluffs. We would just use the linear range. Um, whereas if there was an opponent who folded all the time to bluffs, we may add more of the um, weaker hands to the mix because they'll benefit even more from just getting the opponent to fold on later streets. And we'd be better off playing them as bluffs than playing them as folds because our opponent folds too much. So that's kind of adding in an exploit and a counter in how we can construct our ranges to plan for the opportunity to take advantage of that weakness in our opponent's strategy. And it's the same post-flop, which is why opponent tendencies are so important. They affect how you should shape your range. Hope that makes sense. So choosing the best hands to play pre-flop. Um, we have our tier one hands, which are our big pairs and our big suited aces, suited broadways, tier two hands which are our medium pocket pairs, suited aces, and suited connectors, suited broadways. In our tier three hands, we have our smaller pocket pairs, suited connectors, and offsuit broadways. And then tier four, suited connectors, suited gappers, suited kings, tier five, suited two gappers, queens, and jacks. And the, the key with these hands is the properties of them. Um, the better hands pre-flop will make better hands post-flop. Um, and with these tier one hands, when they flop a set, it's going to be top set uh, on a lot of boards. They're going to have over pairs. And if they flop top pair, it's going to be top pair, close top pair, top kicker. Most of the time, if they make a flush, it's going to be the not flush or in worst case, the second not flush. So these hands, when they hit the flop, they'll have the best of it on the flop and we can play them for a big pot. Whereas the tier two hands, if they flop a set, it's more often mid set not as often top set um, with the suited aces it's top pair if they flop an ace but it's not top pair great kicker and they do have the ability to make the nut flush draw which is what makes them top tier hands and the suited the jack 10 suited and up uh, can make really strong straights and then as we go down we have hands that can make sets but they'll make bottom sets or we'll have hands that can make straights, but they won't be the nut straights and flushes that won't be the nut flushes. So we have to be more cautious with them. Um, we can't exactly just get all our money in when we make a nine high flush, but we can get all our money in with an ace high flush, no matter how many big blinds we have. So look at the concept of implied odds. The, tier, the top tier hands have higher implied odds and the lower tier hands have more reverse implied odds. They can't really play big pots. And then the mid-tier hands are everything in between. Um, as for the tier four hands, suited kings get in here because the king can make top pair, plus they can make the second not flush, um, which can be played you know, for a medium-sized pot, but it just can't be played quite as confidently as an ace. There's a huge difference between the nuts and the second nuts, um, you know, the nuts and everything else. The nuts can play for all the money at any time. The second nuts and down can't. They have to be more selective. So key properties, again, just to review, the best hands have the ability to make top pair, top set, top boat, not flush, not straight. Great hands have the ability to flop a set or combo draws. They won't necessarily be nut draws, but they'll be draws that have lots of equity, high chance of making the best hand um, versus a made hand. And then good hands have the ability to make a marginal draw or top pair that can play for some amount of money, some, some amount of streets of betting, but not all the streets of betting post-flop. Key questions for choosing the best hands. 
Uh, first, look at the math, pre-flop and post-flop, and based on that, what odds are you getting? What percentage of hands do you want to continue with? When it comes to which hands to open, uh, Jonathan's got some great charts for that on pokercoaching.com. It's one of the resources you get as a member. And then when facing an open, um, that's when you look at your opponent's range. What percentage of hands is he playing? Um, can you exploit him post-flop? If so, you want to play more hands. Is he pretty solid post-flop? If so, you want to just play the same amount of hands as him. And based on that, you choose what percent of hands you want to continue with. Um, also, their post-flop tendencies really matter. How do they react to aggression? What's their fold to three bet? Their flop raise? Fold to flop raise? Fold on later streets, etc. Um, just the more you can profile your opponent, the more you can justify widening your range and play more hands because you know where you can, um, you know, make your move on them and put the pressure on and find a profitable bet. Second is determining what hands you want to use to make up that percentage. So if you know you want to play 10% of hands, what is the best 10% of hands to play given the situation? Next, do you have to consider another range? If so, you know, for your 10% raise range, you might not want to do the top 10% of hands. Maybe you want to do the top 7% of hands, call with 5%, and then the next 3% you raise. So if you have to consider another range, you can't just put all the best hands into one range. You want to spread them out over two to ensure that both your ranges um, can withstand pressure on later streets. Um, this is called protecting your range. Fourth is, are there more cards to come? If that's the case, then having draws go up in value, having equity goes up in value, having outs goes up in value. And how deep are you? If you're really deep, then those nut draws go up in value. And if you're super deep, um, the draws that make you the nuts and make your opponent a strong second best hand go up in value. That's when you get really nitty gritty with the hand selection. Um, yeah, and it's how deep are you and how likely is the money to go in the middle? You know, because just because you have 500 big blinds in front of you, if the pot has five blinds, um, in it on the turn, it's unlikely that all those 500 bigs are going in on the river. You know, it's a hundred X pot, which brings us to pot to stack ratio, which is the concept that helps us recognize what is the likelihood of a lot of money going into the pot. Um, so to figure out pot stack ratio, what is it? It's exactly what it sounds like. You take how much is in the pot, take how much is in the effective stack and you create a ratio. It's another concept that Matt Affleck talked about in one of his webinars. Um, so for example, you're playing a one, two, no limit game, small blind raises to 10, big blind calls, pots, $20. You both started the hand with 200. You have 190 behind your pot stack ratio, 9.5. If on the other hand, your opponent started the hand with $70. So the effective stack is 70. Uh, once you raise, 10, get called 10, the pot's 20, 60 behind, the pot stack ratio is $30, or is three. Make sense? Great. And the question is, why is this important? And it has to do with how we plan our hands. Um, if you watch the position webinar, then you'll recall this graphic, which shows how the pots grow from street to street, with them getting bigger and bigger as we get later and later. And when we're gonna be playing a uh, big pot on the river, we wanna have a strong range to prepare for that. So this is where the pot stack ratio really comes in. Um, it's, 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 how we, it's how we plan our hands. So if the money is gonna go all in on the current street, if the next bet is all in, that would be a pot stack ratio of one, assuming a pot size bet. We want hands that can win at showdown in other words, we want to be playing our strongest hands. Probably want to be playing that kind of linear range. Um, if we're calling, if we're betting, we can, I'll talk about it in two slides. Um, if the pot stack ratio is four, which means we have basically two pot size bets left because the first pot size, the first pot bet is one. And then when called by the opponent, there's now three in the middle and the next pot size bet is three which gets us all in. So a pot stack ratio of four means that 
most of the money will go in on the next street. And so in that case, in addition to hands that can win at showdown, we want hands that can improve to strong hands. So think draws, lots of equity, many outs. And if the money is going to go in on a way future street, like the river, we want hands that can improve to strong hands. Um, we want the hands that can improve to nut hands. And it gets even more pronounced as we get deeper. So with that pot stack ratio 40, where it would now take a three streets of betting and a raise to get all the money in, you're really going to need a cooler situation. You want to be uh, preparing to have hands that can play a big pot on the river uh, where your opponent will make a second best hand. I'm trying to think. An example of that would be like, um, what's a good one? King nine five board. Mm, yeah, if you have Jack ten on King nine five, and you make a straight by hitting a queen, there's a good chance your opponent's made two pair with King Queen, and you'll be able to get a lot of action in that spot. Uh, whereas if you have eight seven on that board, King nine five, and you make your gut shot by hitting a six. Your opponent's not going to have as many combinations of five six for two pair as they would uh, king queen for two pair and so that's that's kind of again the nitty gritty of it of seeing not only how many outs does your hand have um but how 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 likely is it to win a setup on a later street um so as stacks get deeper we want to plan for those later streets but when stacks are shallow, we don't need to worry about those cooler situations on later streets. So depending on our pot stack ratio, different properties of hands become more important. Um, and so here's just a quick breakdown of it again as a reminder. So first we check how many streets of betting are left. Pot stack ratio check. When the pot stack ratio is one, we plan for right now. We want raw hand strength and showdown value. Pot stack ratio is two to four. We want to plan for the next street. That's where outs and equity become important. When the pot stack ratio is five to 13, we want to start planning for two streets from now, which is where nut potential is important. And with 14 to 40 pot stack ratio, assuming pot size bets, we want to plan for three streets from now where the implied odds and reverse implied odds, so really getting those setup situations um, becomes important. You know, it's like really, really complex stuff, this range construction stuff. Um, so choosing the best hands to play post-flop, um, here are the properties to consider for each hand. Um, the more of these a hand has, the better. So we have absolute hand strength. That's kind of looking at your hand on a hand chart. You know, do I have trips, two pair, straights, flushes, flush draw, open ender, combo draw. Uh, next we have equity which is your chance of winning versus your opponent's range. Think outs. Um, easy way to do this is to throw a hand into a equity calculator, plug in their range, plug in your hand, and you'll get your equity against them. Future equity is chance of winning if the pot gets big. So instead of thinking of quantity of outs, think of the quality of the outs that you have. If I hit my out, do I have the nuts or could I have the second best hand? Um, if I hit my hand, is my opponent likely to make a second best hand or are they likely to just have a marginal hand that can't give a lot of action anyway if I try to play a big pot? Next, we have backdoor potential, which is a bonus uh, because you pick up extra equity when you have a backdoor draw. So three to a flush draw is better than no draw and three to a straight draw is better than three to a gut shot in terms of bonus equity. Showdown value is your chance of winning unimproved um, vulnerability versus resiliency how many cards can make you second best so an example of this would be like again on that king nine five board um, pocket queens versus pocket tens tens are more vulnerable because the jack and queen can both make a better pair hand than the tens Whereas with queens, there's no extra outs that can make a better pair. I mean, both of them are equally vulnerable to an ace. 
Um, so we'd be more inclined to bet with the tens and more inclined to check with the queens. So if your hand is vulnerable, you need more protection. That's a good reason to bet. Uh, another example would be um, top pair, top kicker on eight, three deuce versus king, three deuce. Um, despite the fact that both hands are the same absolute hand strength, top pair, top kicker, um, the eight, the pair of eights is much more vulnerable because there are more over cards that can come. There are more outs that their opponent can have against them. Uh, and then lastly, blockers. Uh, do you have cards that can alter their range? Um, common example is if, if you have an ace in your hand, um, it's less likely your opponent has an ace in their hand. Um, so you block the best hands. Whereas if you have like a deuce in your hand, your opponent can't have a deuce, so they'll have more strong hands because they won't have twos. Um, and these are just all the different properties that a hand can have. The more of these properties a hand has, the stronger the hand is. Uh, the less they have, the weaker the hand is, and that's kind of how we put our hands on a scale. It's not just what is my absolute hand strength. There are more factors to consider, and the more of them you consider when choosing your hands, um, the more effectively you can construct your ranges. And so when looking at your hands, you want to ask, do I have a value hand, semi-bluff, or a pure bluff? Because when we're talking about balancing our value range and our bluffing range, semi-bluffs are better to have than pure bluffs, and we want to have a mix of both. Um, so here's a little way to visualize hands after the flop. Uh, first we have our nut hands, which are hands that we're ready to play for three streets of value. These are our best hands. We want to go bet, bet, bet with these. And we want to pair those with our nut draws. These are the hands that have that high future equity and probably a good amount of equity as well. And we have our strong made hands, which are probably best uh, for two bets. But if we bet three streets and really reduce our opponent's range, too much, they're no longer going to be the best hand. And we pair that with our strong draws. These would be hands that have high equity, but maybe not a lot of high uh, future equity, or hands that have, say, good showdown value, like, you know, a pair and a draw would be something that would probably fit into a strong draw that we don't want to play for all the streets, um, but we are comfortable playing for a couple. Then we have our weak made hands, which we're just looking to play for one street, and our weak draws. And finally, our air trash, which we don't want to play any streets of betting with these hands. These are the hands that just go into our check folding range right out of the gate. And here's a little way to um, visualize it. We're going to have mostly, you know, we're going to have more air hands than nut hands. And the way I approach it is on the early streets, you know, I'm probably going to bet all the hands that are yellow and green. And then as I move to the turn, I, I lop off the weakest hands, the weak hands, weak draws, continue with the strong ones. And then on the river, uh, lop off the strong ones and just continue with the nut hands and the nut draws. So the more streets of betting um, I'm, I'm going through, whether I'm betting or being bet into, the narrower my range gets and the stronger it gets while still containing some draws in it as well. And so a hand is one with showdown value, stars are semi-bluffs, two stars are two bluffs. And yeah, because I know this goes like, can be a little, actually it can be very overwhelming at first and like examples can be really needed. So for more on this, I'd say check out the work of Ed Miller or James Sweeney because they take you really deep into this with hand examples and get more nitty gritty. Uh, for this presentation, I wanted to introduce the key concepts to be considering and give you kind of the broad strokes, the overarching picture, the holistics of all the things to consider. And then for getting nitty gritty, we can um, work on it more specifically in the future, or you can check out those materials, which will give you examples to really have it click. Um, how to rank hands on the river, which is a unique situation because on the river, what's different is we don't have any draws anymore. We don't have any semi bluffs anymore. So on the previous slide, um, we had the full pyramid 
And I mentioned how we remove hands as we move through the streets and up the pyramid. And so on the last street, we just have the top of the pyramid. We have our value bets that were our nuts the whole way. Uh, we have our draws that didn't improve. Our draws that did improve became value bets. And then we have the hands in the middle, um, you know, those two street hands, which we have as showdown hands. Um, and in this situation is a time where we can now benefit from betting a polarized range. Um, the reason being that, you know, we looked at the golden ratio, we want our value bets and our bluffs to be um, aligned. And our bluffs, our hands that can't win at showdown are the ones that benefit the most from getting our opponent to fold. Whereas our hands that can win on showdown can benefit from check calling because they can win at showdown. Um, a good example of this is if we bet the river whether we're value betting or bluffing, and get raised, uh, we can continue with our value hands and we can fold with our bluffs. Easy. But if we bet a hand that has showdown value and we have to fold to a raise, we may be folding a hand that could have won the pot if it had checked. And so our checking hands are, the, are kind of the middle of our range. We we'll usually want to be checked on the river so we can show it down. And the worst hands will want to be bet because they're the ones that benefit the most from uh, bluffing the river. The key in this situation is to look at the bet size that you're choosing and figure out how many bluffs you need to have to match that. So you see, how many value bets do I have? What bet size am I choosing? And how many bluffs do I need to balance that out? And when you combine those two things, you'll have that perfect ratio. And um, yeah. So value bets can be 50% of the calling range. Um, bluffs will not win at showdown and everything else is what falls between. It can beat, it can beat a portion of the range, but it won't beat 50% of their calling range. Okay. Now I'm going to rock through a little checklist for planning your hand versus a perfect opponent. Uh, first ask, what does my range look like? Second ask, how many streets? Do I want to play with each hand? So putting the hands into the buckets. Um, then third, what bet size will I be using? And based on that, uh, how many value bets you have and what bet size you're using, you can figure out how many bluffs you need to balance your range. Then fifth, once you know kind of what frequencies you're going for, how many hands you need, how many combos you need, then you choose the best candidates to fill those ranges out. And finally, ask, is my checking range protected? You don't want to put all your good hands in your betting range because then your checking range is weak and your opponents, if they're thinking players, can take advantage of that, which a perfect opponent is. But fortunately, we're not playing against perfect opponents. We're playing against human opponents who are going to make mistakes, myself included. Uh, so in this case, checklist I go through is ask, how does my opponent play pre-flop? because their tendencies are what's really gonna dictate uh, the best strategy for you. Do they play perfect? Do they play too loose? Do they play tight? Um, and then look at the post-flop tendencies. On what street are they imbalanced? Do they see bet the flop too much and then give up on the turn? Um, do they not bet the flop enough? Yeah. Do they bet the flop and the turn too much but give up on the river? Or do they triple barrel too much? And based on where they are imbalanced, you can build your range in such a way that you can get to that situation more often and then take advantage of it. Um, third is, do I need to be concerned with balance? Um, if the answer is yes, you know, they're playing pretty solidly. You want to balance your range. If you don't need to be concerned with balance, you can uh, completely adjust your range um, by going unbalanced. So if they call too much, you can value bet more hands, or you can choose a bigger bet size to get more value when you do get called. If they call too little or fold too easily, you can include more bluffs in your range, or you can choose a smaller bet size um, with more of your hands since they're folding 
more than they should and you can risk less uh, for the times they actually wake up with a hand. Uh, that's number five. Is there a better bet size to accomplish my goal? And based on that, can you build multiple ranges with multiple bet sizes to accomplish your various goals in various situations, uh, provided your opponent is not going to adjust to that? So um, the less concerned your opponent is with your hand and your range, uh, the more creative you can get with this. And the more savvy your opponent is, the more thinking your opponent is, the more you want to focus, stick to having balanced ranges in pretty much all situations. Okay, summary. That was a lot of material. That was a lot of material. If you, if it didn't all click, uh, don't sweat it. Um, can rewatch the replay on YouTube. And also I mentioned the resources that you can use to go deeper in. And also uh, Matt Affleck in his most recent webinar did a couple of really good hand examples on range construction. So you can actually see it in action, which I know really helps to solidify it. Uh, just as I said, we're, we're almost an hour without even having examples. So that would have been like two hours without the Q&A. So apologies if I threw a little bit too much info out there. I was just really excited about the material I was studying. I kind of wanted to put it all together. And um, gave my best shot. So in summary, what we learned today is that building and planning your ranges allows you to play more hands and realize more expected value from each hand in the ranges. Two, makes you hard to play against. It makes it easier for you to play because you are preparing for the future situations that you're going to find yourself in. So you know your ranges are protected and you have strong hands for uh, big pots. Three, range construction is allocating your combos to different ranges and different lines, thinking about what am I betting three streets with? What am I betting two streets with? When I'm betting two streets, am I bet check betting? Am I bet bet checking? Am I check bet betting? And that will depend on pot size, type of hand, type of opponent, um, implied odds, etc. Four, against perfect opponents, we want to be balanced with our value to bluff ratio based on bet size. That's that golden ratio, which you can consult the chart anytime you like. Five, against imperfect opponents, we can deviate to exploit their imbalance. Uh, in his book, Poker's 1%, Ed Miller says, you want to follow these rules of having solid ranges and solid frequencies, but when someone breaks the rules, you're welcome to break them too. So if someone is not playing an optimal strategy and you recognize where that imbalance is, you can adjust your ranges and your balance of value to bluff to take advantage of it. Six, minimum defense frequency tells us how much to continue based on bet size and range versus range equity. Seven, playing well pre-flop makes it easier to play well post-flop and playing well on the flop makes it easier to play well on the river. Eight, as the hand progresses, slowly let go of hands and continue appropriately based on your opponent's bet size and range. So we had that pyramid from three slides ago, and we talked about how we, as we move through the hands and we face more betting and we reduce our range and we refine our range, we lop off the weakest hands and only continue with the better hands, the prime candidates. And when facing a bigger bet size, we drop off more of the hands. And when facing a smaller bet size, we drop off fewer of the hands to meet that minimum defense frequency. Uh, nine, when shallow, think showdown value. When deep, think equity. And when super deep, think nut potential. And 10, on the river with hands. On the river, hands with no showdown value benefit the most from bluffing. And hands with showdown value should usually be put into your check and calling range. Okay. And that's my presentation on hand selection and the things to consider to help start structuring your ranges to make you really hard to play against. Uh, if you want to learn more about range construction, see it learn it in action and learn from other coaches who are doing the same pokercoaching.com awesome place to do it. Um, I've really in, been really impressed with all the webinars that have been coming out from Alex and Matt and Jonathan. 
And also the hand quizzes are just, they're so, they're so helpful for learning because it really, fe it's the closest thing you can get to playing poker without playing poker and to be engaged in the action, to make decisions in the moment, you know, be put under pressure to make decisions and get instant feedback on your play. Um, many studies say that the best way to improve at something is to get immediate feedback when you take an action. And these hand quizzes are the best way to get that feedback other than hiring a private coach, which is very expensive. So I'm a huge fan of pokercoaching.com, uh, the hand quizzes uh, and the webinars, and also, you know, the range tools that they have. Jonathan just keeps adding new stuff all the time. He's really gone out of his way to make the most complete training program out there. And when you sign up for pokercoaching.com, you'll also get access to float the term for free which is a lot of extra videos and I actually listened to a podcast from Jonathan today. That guy might be the hardest working guy in the industry. Just so much, so much respect to him for just constant, constant grinding work ethic, always looking to improve, always looking to help his customers, always looking to um, meet the requests that are brought to him. And that's how we built up a library of 786 poker videos. Um, poker coaching has a seven day free trial. As you said in the podcast, go ahead, sign up, binge it. If you don't want to pay cancel after seven days, you don't mind. Um, odds are you're probably going to enjoy it. You're probably going to stick with it. Uh, it's, it's just a great program. And with that, we'll get into the questions part of the presentation. And, um, as I mentioned, I'm probably going to be doing a webinar on the World Series of Poker, how to plan your trip to the World Series of Poker and how to just get the most out of your time there and, you know, conserve your energy, save money, all the keys, you know, the, the things that you wouldn't think of in terms of how to give yourself the best advantage. Um, so it's going to be about energy management, focus, cutting out distractions, saving money, cutting down on stress, all those things. Uh, I've been going to the World Series for, wow, I think this will be my 12th year going to the World Series. I started going in 2008, and I've learned a lot uh, from being in Vegas. And so that's a topic that I know like the back of my hand, um, unlike... Range construction is one that I know some about, but when we get into the deep theory, some of it, I'm like, like, man, this is, this is tough, dense stuff. But when it comes to trip planning and where to stay, where to play, how to get in the zone, all that stuff, that's where I really shine. So I'm going to be doing a presentation on that. Not sure when, but if you want to update on that, follow Grips Poker on Twitter and uh, you'll be informed. Okay. Chris says it all clicked. Nice presentation. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, Chuck says, I don't know what to ask. I'll have to review the replay first. Awesome, dude. You can just, if you post a question in the comment section of the replay on Jonathan's YouTube or my YouTube, I will be in there to give you an answer uh, for sure. Uh, great presentation, Evan. Is position key with pre-flop and post-flop strategies from this lesson? Yeah, so, so it's kind of like a three-step system. So step one is play hands in position because you're going to get the information advantage. Step two is choose um, the right betting size based on what you want to accomplish. And then step three is choose the range of hands that you want to use based on the bet size that you chose. So this is kind of the last step in three. So position gives you the first edge, bet size gives you the second edge, and then hand selection gives you the third edge and ensures that you get the most out of your betting and position advantage. Uh, Kevin says, where to access the replay? Jonathan Little's YouTube channel will be uh, the place to access it first. I think he'll, he, he's super fast. He'll probably upload it like tomorrow. Richard says, thanks, Evan. Almost skipped this webinar. So glad I did not. Thanks for the excellent material. Okay, so you, so this stuff was clicking for you guys. This was making sense? Because I, I went through it four times and each time I'm like, man, I hope I'm going to be able to, to communicate it really well because it's, it's tough stuff. 
but Jonathan says, thank you. Very, imp very informative. We'll have to rewatch it on YouTube. I found with this stuff, like that, that hearing, getting access to the overarching theory multiple times was really key. And then I was able to dive deeper because I saw how it all fit together. Um, and that's why I wanted to cover as much of it as possible to give you the big picture rather than dialing in on one area and having that be the entire presentation. So I, I hope that that was appreciated. Bob Harmon says, thank you. Great info in here. Checks this. Thanks, Evan. Um, oh, man, this is awesome. Thanks, guys. Gary says, great material. Applying this material is what separates casual versus better player. Must admit, I'll have to watch again. Uh, where to find the Affleck webinar? Also on Jonathan Little's YouTube channel. Great place to go. Thanks. Okay, sort of a bit new too, but we'll get there. Thanks. And also, guys, I'm going to be practicing this myself because I'm I'm now in the process of working on my game in preparation for the World Series. So I'm going to be going through these sorts of analysis and doing examples, and I'll probably share those on my channel as I get more smooth with them. So uh, know that there will be lots of examples coming in the future to help this stuff sink in and help it click for you. Uh, John's going down for the Big 50 on Sunday. Good luck, brother. Will you be playing any of the tournaments this next week? No, I'm not going to go down to the World Series uh, just yet. I have not decided when I'm going to go down. Um, but there are some some orders of business I want to take care of before I go. Uh, I want to get things running smooth with grips. And I think for poker coaching, I'm set. But I want to get things running with grips. I want to... Get some steady stuff going on YouTube. And my nephew has his birthday in mid-June. So I probably want to be home for that. And after that's done, I'll probably head down to the World Series. Um, get my grind on. Right now, I'm in a process of cultivating energy rather than expending energy. And given the long days that tournaments are, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save my energy for the big tournaments at the end. Um, and just... I live on the East Coast, so travel time also takes a toll and, you know, hotel living versus home living. I'm, I'm just, I'm going to wait for it. I'm going to wait for it when it feels right. You'll see me there. Okay. Rahul, thanks, Evan. Really appreciate all the work you're putting in for us. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks, came in late, but it's a great refresher. Add some more numbers to try to integrate. Sweet. Sweet. I think it clicked for me was pre-flop, linear as a lead, post-flop. Pre-flop, linear as lead, pre-flop, polar as three bet. Yeah, it's just when you expect to have a good amount of fold equity, having a polarized range benefits. And early on, early on in hand, you can have more bluffs then you can later in a hand too, because you can give up with those bluffs as the hand progresses. So kind of on the river, you'll have the least bluffs followed by more bluffs on the turn, followed by the most bluffs on the flop with the same amount of value hands, right? And then on the turn, you'll have, you know, same value hands, but less bluffs. And then on the river, you'll have the least bluffs. Um, thanks, Alex. Thank you, Angelo. That says, hopefully helpful comment, Evan. I know you're enthused about the subject. Work on the verbal presentation. Vocal inflection is important to maintain concentration during what is somewhat bland but important. Yeah, great, great point, Pat. I appreciate that that feedback that, yeah, to get people to really stay focused, to use the inflection to hammer down points. Um, I will say, of the triple threat, this is the section I'm the least... Um, seasoned in and that's probably why I didn't have quite the same intonation that I did on the position section and the aggression section um, but that's where the practice and the reps will come in and next time we talk about selection I'll give you I'll give you that vocal inflection to really hammer it home thank you thank you for the feedback Pat I appreciate it Kira says thanks Evan good job trying to communicate a difficult subject this is way more info than I expect I'll have to go back and review again and again yeah sorry I might It was more slides before I cut it. I cut out like half the slides I had. I really got it. I really got to slow down on the trying to over deliver. Oh man. Good luck with the range building, Carlo. Um, 
Kevin said, good job, allows review for me, but made me easy, made me realize other players are studying. GG. Kevin, if you're working on this stuff, you are way ahead of the game. You're in the top percentile. This is, when you're getting nitty gritty on range construction, you're in the top. So trust me, <laughs> you're way ahead of the game if you're on that. And a lot of people are way behind you. Do I offer one-on-one -on -one coaching, asked Jeff? Yes, I do. Uh, info is available at my website, gripst.com. Uh, or Jeff, if you want to tweet me, I'll happily give you a direct link with the uh, info for coaching. Cool, Mike, glad you enjoyed it. Stanislav, good luck in the big 50 on Thursday. Happy stacking. Dean, great question. How often do I meditate daily? And uh, on days like today where I'm really pouring a lot of extra energy into um, computer work, preparing slides and whatnot. I got three sessions in today. Um, yeah, when I'm, when I'm at my best, I'm meditating twice a day. Um, I, I always try to get in at least one. And when I feel that I need to just really build up energy reserves and build up, you know, some call it prana, some call it chi, some call it organ, um, some just call it energy, I'll meditate more because every time that we go within, we shut out the world, we're cultivating energy, we're charging the battery. Whereas every time the senses are exposed to the world, we're draining the battery, we're draining that energy. Even if it's at a slow rate because we're doing something enjoyable or at a high rate because we're doing something stressful, we are draining the battery. And the easiest way to recharge the battery other than sleep is to sit in silent contemplation uh, in a peaceful environment and just breathe. Okay. What's the best defense if someone seems to be using your calculations against you? Um, Joel, that's where you can, you can fall back on the golden ratio. You can just play a perfectly balanced range, in which case they can't exploit you. Um, that would be the best, best defense. Revert back to just a perfectly balanced strategy. Um, yeah, where when you're betting, you have the right amount of value to bluffs based on the odds you're laying your opponent. And when your opponent is betting against you, continue with the right amount of hands based on that minimum defense frequency and then just choose the best hands. So when you really get nitty gritty into ranges and you look at them from all the angles um, that we talked about, you know, the, uh, the absolute hand strength, equity, Future equity, backdoor draw, showdown value, vulnerability versus, um, what, what word did I use? Resiliency, yeah. And blockers, and you're just choosing the best hands, that's the defense. That is the defense. Um, and then, yeah, if you think they're adjusting, you can try to play the guessing game, but if you just revert to a solid strategy, uh, that's balanced. There's nothing they can really do to take advantage of you. So I would just say, do more practice, do more study away from the table, do more homework and be ready. Uh, how do we make adjustments when we're in multi-way pots? Um, play tighter ranges in general. Um, play better hands. Uh, be more rigid with your hands that you continue with because um, you know, that minimum defense frequency is shared and also be more selective with the hands that you bet because when you have two opponents instead of one, it's less likely both people are going to fold and therefore um, you're not going to hit the break-even success frequency, break-even success ratio as much. Too many, <laughs> too many theoretical terms today, man. Sorry, y'all. Um, you're less likely to meet that break-even success rate and therefore you need higher equity, you need better hands. So I would just say play tighter and more selectively in multi-way pots. Yeah, I, I agree, Pat. I'll get some examples in the next one. I felt when I was making the presentation, I'm like, I need some examples. And then I put an example, I'm like, that's gonna take 20 minutes. So I, I had a compromise. Yes, Fritz, totally. Um, 
with the pyramid graph to show combos, that's where I like uh, James, Swe James Sweeney's work. He does a really good job of visualizing the pyramid. Um, he's, he's, got a, he's got a whole course on uh, the 1%, which is worth investing in if you're really serious about your game. Uh, JL usually recommends a 2 to 1 value to bluff ratio. Value bluff bluff. Value bluff bluff in terms of... Er, Fritz, can you type that again as I catch up? Um, should you only bluff with deep stacks? No. Um, you can bluff with shallow stacks too. It's just when you're bluffing with deeper stacks, you would prefer to have equity. And when you're bluffing with really deep stacks, you want hands that can make the nuts. So with really deep stacks, you want to think about implied odds versus reverse implied odds. Can you, will you make the nuts or the second, second nuts? Uh, with medium depth stacks, uh, you'd like to have as many outs and equity as possible with your bluffs. And then with shallow stacks, um, where you don't need to think about equity, blockers would be the consideration. If you are bluffing, ideally you would want to have hands that block uh, your opponent's calling range. So on a like, you know, queen seven, two board, having a king in your hand is a good blocker because it decreases the times your opponent has queen king, which is one of the hands that he's going to call you with. Maybe even having a jack in your hand helps because it blocks queen jack. Um, and that's it. But again, that's, that's when you get really nitty gritty and granular. And um, like I said, James course is about six hours, maybe eight hours breaking that down. So you get pretty deep there. But yeah, you, you, you want to bluff all the time. You kind of want to have bluffs in all ranges. Uh, your one barreling range, two barreling range, three barreling range. It's just which hands are best to use as bluffs in which situations that really leads to um, good range construction. Okay. Pocket Ace is M. Great to understand theory. Another thing to put all in practice in the moment. Appreciate the material, dude. Thanks for tuning in, man. Appreciate you being here. Cool. Fritz, uh, interesting thing actually for the two to one value, bluff to value ratio in the work of Matthew Janda on the river, he suggested two to two value for one bluff on the turn, one value for one bluff and on the flop one value for two bluffs. And then if you were to take it one street further, it would be one value to four bluff. So that's one way to look at it. And the other thing is if you're doing a different bet size, you would have a different value to bluff ratio. Uh, key though, is your passion comes through and we truly appreciate it. Thanks, John, man. I appreciate that comment a lot. I appreciate that comment a lot. Uh, Jeff, Kim, TY, how many buy-ins should you play when playing cash games? Depends if you're professional or part-time um, and what your risk tolerant how comfortable are you i would basically say that when you're playing um if you feel nervous or uncomfortable you're probably playing um with too few buy-ins or too high stakes if you feel bored then you're playing with too many buy-ins or too small stakes so it should really be a feeling thing and also um yeah, feeling is one how you can tell if you're playing too big, too small. And and um, in terms of like just average, if if you're playing part time, it's it's really up to you. If you can reload, it's really up to you. Uh, and if you're playing full time, I don't know, probably like fifty to a hundred buy-ins to be safe, but you can play as aggressively or as conservatively with your bankroll as possible. It really depends on what environments you thrive in. Uh, Fritz, I submit a homework for jail? No. Okay. Um, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll check with Jonathan about that because he has more experience than I when it comes to that. Um, Range construction, always pretty obsessive with it. 
Uh, Dean, it's amazing when you tap your source. Yes, feels like you're stronger than your opponent. Feel like you're stronger than your opponent. Should you steer away from coin flip situations? In a cash game, yes. In a tournament, depends on the structure. Uh, if the structure is very fast, um, sometimes you can't really wait for a better spot. If you're getting profitable odds, you should run the cards. Um, but if the structure is really good or you have a lot of time, then yeah, you should definitely avoid coin flip situations because you know, if you can have a 55, 45% edge on someone, you know, in a coin flip, um, is that bigger than the edge you'll have if you, you know, make them play flops, turns and rivers against you. Like that's why Helmuth never wants to take coin flips because he thinks with his reads um, and his ability to kind of assess where other people are at, he probably thinks his edge on people is 60, 70, 80%, which may be a little absurdly high, but that's kind of the idea. So if, if you think you're stronger than your opponent, if you have a good read on him, you want to avoid coin flips and close spots with them because that gives them a chance to get lucky. And when you have an edge on some, you want to take as much luck out of the equation as possible. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Good luck with the homework, Fritz. Appreciate you being here. Um, and keep studying, man. Keep being on top of your game. Um, feel free to to tag me in your homework with Jonathan so he, he can check in with me too. I'd like to get his feedback. He's a pretty sharp dude. Joel says, should I avoid bluffing against multi-way pots or multiple pots and all-ins? Generally, yes. Generally, generally yes. Um, the more opponents that are in there, the less you should want to bluff. Um, you could semi-bluff if you have the right hands. You know, if, if you have uh, a nut flush draw, nothing wrong with building a pot, especially where people are going to call with worse draws. Um, but if you're pure bluffing, like you have no hand and no draw, then uh, the more opponents you have, the less inclined you should do that. Uh, you should be giving up a lot of hands when uh, you're in a four or five way pot. Craig is playing the Big 50 on Sunday. First WSOP appearance. Can you share a sneak? Okay, cool. Um, can you share a sneak peek from your upcoming WSOP webinar? First timer could benefit from. Craig, how long are you going to Vegas for? And what is the biggest tournament you've played prior to this? Because I think the, the, the main thing I would offer is don't put too much pressure on yourself. Yes, it's your first time playing at the WSOP. Awesome. Congratulations on making it down there. Um, but if you hype it up too much. Okay, cool. So 300 you've played, now you're playing a five. Um, if you hype it up too much, you probably won't bring your best game, right? Whereas if you treat it like it's, um, you know, if you approach it with the same mindset that you approach your usual $300 tournaments and you say, okay, Yes, the World Series of Poker, but I am just playing another tournament. Yes, the $500 tournament, but the play is probably going to be similar to my $300 tournament. And you have confidence in yourself and you trust in yourself. You're going to be able to play your best game. The most important thing when playing poker tournaments is trusting yourself, being confident in yourself, and believing in yourself because that's what's going to bring out your intuition. It's what's going to bring out your reads. It's what's going to bring out your instincts. If you're nervous, you're tense, you've hyped it up too much, or you put too much pressure on yourself, you're going to be blocked from that intuition. You may start doubting your decisions, and then there's a downward spiral of that. Um, so really trusting your skill set, believe in yourself, and that way you can play your best game. And then also recognize that 
where you finish in the tournament is largely outside your control. You're going to play your best game and that's what you can focus on. But where you finish will be a combination of that and how your luck is on that day. So focus on what you can control, which is your decision making, your confidence in yourself, your belief in yourself. And forget about what you can't, which is, um, you know, what cards you're going to get, whether you're going to win a race, whether you're going to cool your opponent, etc. Play it one hand at a time. Focus on what you can control. Trust in yourself and enjoy the experience. Um, Take your time to get comfortable. Plan your food ahead of time because especially during that tournament, it's going to be a crap show at the Rio. And ideally, you know, you want to be able to spend breaks on your own time to recharge and, you know, eat in a peaceful environment and all that. If you're caught up in the rush on breaks and, you know, not knowing where to eat and whatnot, it's going to drain a lot of your energy. It's going to waste a lot of your decision-making power that you'd rather have for the poker tables. So take some time to get comfortable, figure out what your food options are, um, plan that out, make sure that's taken care of so that you can have all your energy when it's time to play to focus on poker and making decisions at the tables. Hope that helps. And I wish you all the best at the World Series of Poker, Craig. My pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, Chuck says, if I bust out on a bad beat, only on a bad beat, of the big 50 during the first X levels, should I rebuy? Um, okay, few things to consider with that, Chuck. First is, do you believe you can play the stack size well that you'll be starting with? So look at the blinds before you re-enter and say, can I play that stack size well? The answer is yes. That's a point for re-entering. If the answer is no, it's a point for not re-entering. Um, and then second is, am I emotionally affected from getting knocked out? If the answer is yes, that's a point for no. If the answer is no, that's a point for yes. And the last question I would ask is, am I re-entering to chase my first buy-in and try to, you know, get back to even? Or am I re-entering because I legitimately feel like I can play my best poker? I, I feel like I'm playing well in the tournament. I'm on my game today and I want to keep going. That's the main consideration. Um, so it's really, how do you feel? What is, how confident, how do you feel emotionally? How confident do you feel about your ability with that stack? And are you able to let go of being eliminated before, or are you going to carry that with you? And, you know, trust yourself in the moment. Also know that there's no rush to re-enter. If you get knocked out, you can take half an hour before you re-enter. You can take an hour before you re-enter. You don't need to do it right away. And if you step away, you know, walk down the Rio hallway, go outside and just take a minute to breathe and check in. Maybe, uh, you go to the main entrance and down the stairs there's some benches you can sit on then you can really assess whether it makes sense to hop back in or not whereas when you're in there you're in the room you're in the crowd you're in the hype it's easy to just get pulled in um so i, I would separate myself from the event and then um decide but ultimately you're going to make that decision for yourself you'll know what's best for you i can just give you the factors to consider and the questions to ask yourself um Angela said, depending on how long you're staying, enter the next day versus the same day. Yeah, I mean, it really comes down to, down to feel. You got to ask yourself, like, do I want to play more poker today? Am I excited to play more poker today? Am I ready for another eight hours or am I feeling kind of tired? You know, just do a check-in. Uh, Sally knows, yeah, the first WSOP experience can be overwhelming. But yeah, just enjoy it and play your best game. I really like to come in with a, a, a mind of gratitude and think about how blessed I am to even have the opportunity to play in the tournaments. And that really puts me in a positive state that leads to making good decisions. And also leads to me not being too concerned with the outcome. Because if I get eliminated, I'm already in a positive state of gratitude and I'm, I'm grateful for what I get to do afterwards. Uh, and if I build up a stack in the tournament, even better, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to keep playing poker. Um, when you have alternatives that you can look forward to, 
when you're not playing, it makes it much easier to play your best game because tournaments, you know, to play them well involves taking in an element of high risk and being at peace with potentially getting knocked out. Um, so if you have good things to look forward to, it's easy to stick with it. But I know when I wasn't, you know, too happy with myself, when I was feeling depressed or going through, uh, you know, pitfalls of addiction and stuff, I would try to stay in the tournament for as long as possible because when I got eliminated, I had to go back to, you know, the rest of my life, which I wasn't too happy with at the time in retrospect. And it, it led to just not playing optimally. It led to not playing well because I wasn't playing to win. I was playing to not lose and um, play to win. You know, if you're going for the dream, you're looking to win a million dollars, you got to play to win. You can't play to not lose. Probably not going there to min cash. Um, yeah. Clifton says, I was surprised by you telling someone to wait to re-enter. I look at it like this. If you want to get a big hand, the best way to do it is to not miss any hands. In a nine-hour online tournament, I have a P-Jar and I don't miss a hand. Yeah, I, I know that approach. Um, that was the approach I took in my younger years is the fear that like I don't want to miss a hand. There might be something good. I have a, I have a nice story. Uh, one year... I have no idea which year it was because I've gone to the World Series so many times. I was playing some $1,500 tournament and, you know, we were on break. Uh, and I knew the clock was ticking down. I'm like, oh man, I got to make sure I get back. And I ran back to the table. Ran back to the table. It was perfect. Just enough, just in time to look down and see Ace King. Perfect. Now, Here's the thing about the situation is because I rushed back and I was in that mindset of got to get it, got to be on top of it, can't miss anything, everything matters, super intense. I had a lot of adrenaline running through my system, maybe some cortisol as well, the stress hormones that lead to impulsive, instinctual decision making as opposed to you know rational, well thought out decision making. And so even though I got back there in time to get dealt that big hand, I wasn't in the right state of mind to play my best. I was disconnected from my higher processing. Um, I think there was a raise from early position. I think I jammed because I had, you know, 20 blinds or something. And uh, opener had aces. And I'm like, well, I'm really glad I rushed back in time for this hand because I didn't want to miss it. But just as you can you know, think, oh, well, I want to make sure I'm there in case I get a good hand, I get a cooler. You could also be there to get cooler as well. So yes, there's going to be some edges well, but uh, in terms of like getting a big hand, just as likely to get a, a cooler going the other direction. And the thing is, if you're in an amped up state of mind, you are less likely to play your best. Whereas when you're in a calm state of mind, you're gonna play your best. You're gonna make the most of it if it's cooler, you're gonna lose the minimum if it's cooler against you, whatever. You're gonna make better decisions in general. And so the main thing about saying wait to re-enter is wait to ensure you're in a calm state of mind. If you're, you know, Zen master, always calm no matter what, unaffected by every hand that happens, by all means, re-enter right away. You're in the right state of mind. But it's if you are rattled or emotionally affected from losing the previous hand or getting eliminated from the tournament, give yourself time to process that and release it before coming back to the tournament. Because if that feeling, anger, regret, whatever it is, doubt, is still in your system when you go back to the poker table, you, you can bet your last chip it's going to affect your future decision making and emotional decision making is not optimal decision making at poker. Um, so that's that's why I made the the invitation to take time to wait before re-entering. Um, it's it's all about when are you going to be in your best state of mind and where's your biggest edge. Um, you know, if you play really well deep stack, it makes sense to want to play more hands. If you're someone who plays, who can play really well, but can only play well for six hours, actually you're a perfect candidate to late reg. 
take some time to relax, hit the gym, and then come back. Um, yeah. That's the invitation about it, and it's it's not going to work for everyone, but it's something that I know works for me. I've seen what happens when I'm in the rushy, needy, um, scarcity kind of mindset. There's limited amounts of stuff versus when I'm in that calm, collected, grateful, abundance mentality that as long as I'm at my best um, and I show up, good things will happen. Uh, And if it means I miss an hour, the value that I'll gain for the extra five hours of play because I got back to a good state of mind in that hour is worth the hour that I gave up as opposed to, you know, six hours of B game is not worth five hours of A game. Might not even be worth three hours of A game. Um, So that's kind of the, the reasoning behind that, Clifton. But your system your approach probably totally works for you, right? And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's that classic old saying. Um, so, yeah. But I, I know that mindset because there was also a time when I was playing uh, the Sunday Major on Full Tilt way, way back in the day, maybe 80 people left in tournament, and I did not have a P-Jar with me. I went to the bathroom. When I came back, I had missed one hand, and uh, it was aces, and I would have got it all in against two opponents who had kings and queens, and I would have held. So it can go both ways, and uh, back that time, I was not happy about missing that hand. Uh, I was very upset about missing that hand. I didn't think about, well, it could have just as easily been me with the queens or with the kings. I just thought, I can't believe I missed that. That was my one chance. Um, I think it was the brawl back in the day. So I, un- I understand the uh, don't want to miss a hand mindset, Clifton. I totally, I totally get it. Um, any other questions that anyone has before we wrap Happy to answer. Um, And again, if you want more talk on World Series of Poker, planning the trip, how to stay in the best uh, state of mind and all that, follow me on Twitter at Grips Poker. And I'll be posting an announcement about that whenever I lock in a date. My unscheduled self. Okay, looks like we don't have any more questions, so I am going to end the webinar. Um, Thank you again to everyone who tuned in. And for the replay, Aaron, it will be uploaded to Jonathan Little's YouTube channel as soon as possible, probably within the next two days. He's pretty on top of that. Um, So... If you're subscribed there, you'll be set and we'll be tweeting the replays and all that stuff. You will definitely be informed. I really appreciate you all uh, sharing your evening with me tonight. Um, Glad you found this presentation uh, educational and valuable. Uh, It's a real honor to get to serve you and share my poker knowledge with you. Uh, I'm excited to learning alongside you, becoming the best players we can be together. And um, hope to see you uh, with a big stack in a cash game or at the final table of some tournament sometime soon. Feel free to tweet me your winner's picks. They always get me happy and excited and motivated. Um, Wish you a wonderful evening. And until next time, good luck and happy stacking. I think I hit... Stop on. Evan Jarvis wishing you all the best. That's not, that's how I stop the screen, but you guys can still hear me. Okay. Now, now I'm, I'm, I'm gone for good.
Bye, everybody. Have a great night.